We are here at another episode of Tea Without Talks, and I am so over the moon to have one of my best friends in the world come and join us today, Amin Gulji, who is this multi-talented artist, sculptor, and curator of many shows and exhibitions globally, and as well as the curator of the first Karachi finale, and so many more things. His sculptures even at the United Nations in New York, and he is the pride of Pakistan, and someone who all of us are in awe of. So we're here and we're gonna have a very special chat, a no holes conversation on everything about what's going on in our lives as well as the COVID-19 situation and the holistic larger meanings of that. So we will be prepared for a conversation to end all conversations. And on that note, I invite Amin to come join me in the studio. Hi, Hi Uzra. How wonderful to see you. It is so wonderful to see you too. But before we get into our questions, I am in a state of shock because it's my first time seeing you in your eye banker look. Look at that. <laughs> I just thought that one percent is getting so very rich during this time. So it's a homage to them. I can totally understand that thinking. It's just that I'm still in a state of shock because everyone knows that I'm formal. But when you said you were going to bring it, you said prepare for me to bring it on Monday. And I was I'm like, oh, you know, he'll be having some amazing jewelry and some amazing regalia. And you come as an eye banker. And I feel like I'm in my asset management talks. Rather than <laughs> <laughs> you look amazing, by the Thank way. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. And I believe that's a, a, a style of sophisticated pink tie as well. Red. It's red. red. Okay. It's red. It's it Emmet. matches our banners. Red. Okay. <laughs> yes. Because secretly and not that secretly, it means actually quite conservative. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so and, I, and I'm not joking there. <laughs> so thank you so much for being on To That Talks. We love having you here and welcome you. And no, it's a pleasure. I, no, absolutely. And what we want to know first is why don't you talk a little bit about you in terms of your story, your passions and your path, and then I'll get into more deep dive questions on that. But okay, just so holistic ask me first. a specific question and then okay, we start. So what age were you? Do you remember the exact moment when you saw your first piece of art? Well, I mean, Uzra, as you know, my parents didn't want me to be an artist. Uh, they were super liberal with me. I didn't want to be an artist. I uh, studied economics at Yale. And then um, I did another major in art history, which sort of changed the course of my life. And um, I specialized in Mughal gardens and I won a prize for my thesis and it totally corrupted me. Okay, but I mean, corruption is corruption and falling in love is falling in love. I think they're both one and the same. <laughs> so, so we have called today's talk Love, Life, and Other Disasters. So, In the I'll time of cholera. <laughs> okay, brilliant. So um, I'm just wondering what is, okay, um, it's saying that we're going to start live in three minutes. What's going on, Amin? And I don't know, as well. You're okay. you're in control. Okay, so we are not live as yet. Super. No, but this is being recorded for YouTube. So anyhow, so we okay. will continue okay. going while Ahmad finds out what's. Uh... Oh, Ahmad. Ahmad. Anyhow, so we will continue. If it goes uh, live again, we will continue. But what does it mean? Three minutes left. Ahmad, guide me. Okay. Yeah, we're just going to check what's going on on my page. It says live on my screen, Ultra. It's live now. I am live. I don't know why. You I'm are live. live. So, You're so alive. Okay, Yay. Great. So, so am I. I. So, okay, so fine. So let's go on to our amazing, amazing beginnings of you because you, you went to economics major choice at Yale. Yes, First of all, because why I'm did South you go Asian. First of all, I'm a man. I'm South, South Asian. Asian. I'm the good South Asian boy. Also, my parents paid for my education. I, you know, I felt like I should major in something that sounds practical. Okay, so you're sitting there becoming a suitable boy 
in the actual real Inshallah. episode of Oprah. <laughs> Remember that book, that bestseller? So you went to Yale, you did <laughs> economics, and you were prepared to dress No, I got as corrupted, as remember? I did uh, this French-American girl, Dominique Malaké, took me to my first art history class, and it kind of changed my life. I mean, I enjoyed it so much more than I enjoyed economics, and I started taking one class after another, and soon I had a major in it. Okay, so we are, um, you know, absolutely wondering what it was like for you when you started your first day at economics. Were you... Horrible. I hated it. I mean, thank God my roommate, Paulo Lopez, loved economics and got me through the major. I found it absolutely boring. I remember going to corporate strategy, which was only for people who's, who are econ majors senior year and this girl says excuse me i think this is only for econ majors i'm an econ major okay and mm -hmm. when you're sitting there and this girl is like you're an econ major did you feel inauthentic or did you feel now nah, learn how to make money? no i felt like why am i here but i got an a in it <laughs> of course you got an a in economics now we are i'm south asian Okay. So we are absolutely in awe of how you get these A's, okay? So you're sitting It's not here. that difficult. No, 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 but you're in Even economics. a dumbass like me can do it. You are absolutely in this world of economics instead of art. And you're sitting there saying, I'm not me. And yet you go and you No, 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 I never said that. Was, I was exactly myself. Even it was then, them, they were the economics. ones who were surprised. Oh, yeah. I don't change. I cannot change. That's something I realized when I was 17 years old is this is the way it is. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much a given. Okay, so many of us, someone like me, has been on a journey of self-discovery, finding right. more and more my way to myself and shedding layers, being more and more authentic at each moment. Uh, and now I'm really good. But you mean that you came out of the womb as authentic as it is and, you know, never struggled with that. Well, well you know, some, some people, people just can't, can't help, help it, Uzra. I have, I have no senses on me and never have. Uh, so it is what it is. No, but it's beautiful and it's lovely. Is it? <laughs> no, it's it. not. <laughs> of course it is. Because the whole goal, I believe, of life is to be yourself. No. Yes, you know that. You know how, how hard I fight to be myself. I, I, you know, I mean, now I'm so supported in being, like, true and authentic to myself. But I remember, I remember the first time I met you. It was with your father. And I saw the light in your eyes. And I saw the power in your soul. And I thought... This woman is going to do things. And she, you, you have done many a thing, Uzra Daoud. Yes, but I, I know. On your own. Yes, aside from your family legacy and aside from, you know, all the advantages and privilege that you have, you've used your privilege for good things, Uzra. No, thank you. You always say, and very earnestly, the most beautiful things. But I have to say... I'm not trying to be nice here. No, I know. You're I'm not nice. nice. I know that. Ask I anybody. Know. Ask Sarah Pagambala, who's sitting in front of me. <laughs> I'm not nice. Hi, Sarah, too. <laughs> but, um, I mean, the thing is that I remember that moment we met, too. And you always talk about that energetic exchange, and you knew we'd be friends. And yes. And really, like, talk about how relationships, like... How you know, you, you've talked to me a lot about even love or relationship being a gift. And life. sex. <laughs> Many things. <laughs> you've always talked about um, relationships being a gift from God. And that's yeah, one thing especially for me, Uzra John, especially for me. I've got a bit of Asperger in me. I find the human race extremely difficult. I mean, I like the realm of books, you know, <laughs> the books are easier. Books are so much easier. Other people's stories are wonderful to fall into. Uh, these waves, these tales, these narratives, these worlds that you can be a part of. Sometimes human beings are difficult for me. So for me to interact with and feel comfortable with, I, I need an energy, male or female. I need a certain energy and then I'm lucky, 
the people who come into my life stay in my life. That's very beautiful and powerful. And I know I've been very blessed to have you in my life and stay in my life. And as an English lit major who, you know, is obviously... See, you were wise. <laughs> you were economics too. Both of us did economics. Oh, I you poor girl. I <laughs> you and poor I know secret baby. <laughs> But I meant that I always uh, dreamed of how beautiful I wanted my library to be and so forth. And you know that books has been a solace for me as well as a, a, an amazing eye opener. But for you, I want to deep dive into that a bit more because when you, um, when this lockdown happened, when COVID happened, is the first thing you did is read Albert Camus' The Plague. Yes, and I thought it was an appropriate <laughs> book. <laughs> Let's get the French perspective. Yes, and also it was, it was trendy to read the plague at that time. Oh, I, I, look, Uzra, I'm so beyond trends. I mean, are you kidding me? I would never know what trendy is. <laughs> I'm lost in my own gaga land. Okay, well, you know, uh, I did one of my thesis on Albert Camus, but L'Etranger, The Stranger, The Outsider. Right. It was your first introduction to Camus. I want to know that were you watching the YouTube videos about COVID? Were you no, doing, reading no. the experts? Your first instinct was to read Camus. Yes. yes. And so can you talk about where, was it solace for you reading or was it just... Reading for me is always solace. It's a way for me to escape, Ozra. And it always, always been. I mean, as in high school, I mean, my idea of a weekend was going to a library and checking out books. And then... It would be wonderful. I'd have this little attic room, and for two days, my parents were uber social. They kept on being uber social till they died. And I was like, yay, myself alone. Buy all. <laughs> Love you, but. <laughs> so I was, you know, a totally very pampered child. So my dad would take me to the bookstore every week and says, whatever you want to buy, you can buy. Yeah, I mean... And then I spent the rest of my life living at the library, you know? Yeah. But I, the, my fondest Librarians childhood. love me. <laughs> you know, I, I literally, my childhood memories was reading. And yeah. I know yours were too. But also yours were alone. And our parents were such good friends and totally, totally um, very social. Yes. And what's it, what was it like growing up with such social parents? Fantastic. It was a circus. You never knew. You'd come home from school and there'd be something else happening this huge parade of people coming in and out of the house. And then at night they would be entertaining and we would be brought down for the, you know, 10 minutes and saying, hello, uncle, hello, auntie. And we brushed away, which was lovely. And then you'd go up and I'd go back to my box. But I mean, you never had to sing that song from Sound of Music. <laughs> 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 so Honey, I don't sing. <laughs> I do when I'm happy. Out of tune and joyous. No, for sure. But when you're growing up and your parents, and are obviously such famous parents as you have. You're right. Iconic, talented. Your father was beyond gifted, world famous. Uh, he was sketching presidents and so forth. And your mother was the quintessential powerhouse. Oh, she was. And the two. She's a tiger. Are, yes, no, it's, it's amazing. When I look at men who don't marry strong women, I'm like, what's wrong with you? I mean, you know, the only woman that's worth a while is a strong woman who's independent, powerful, intelligent. I mean, those are the kind of eggs you have to run after. And, well, I couldn't agree more with you, but... No, uh, I, I, I mean, if you're going to procreate, it takes the egg and the sperm, girl. It's yes. both your gene pools coming together. Yes, no, that's, a, that's an intelligent insight into that and very accurate. But I want to talk about the fact that they were also madly in love. They had a very well. They were passionate. passionate. Yes, they, they were. They were love story. They married in Paris, and you know, talk about what it was like surrounded by their love too, for both each other and of course. Well, for it, it was intense because they were truly, really interested in each other. Uh, they had a real partnership. I mean, it kind of puts my faith back into heterosexuality because they were so bonded. And because they were so bonded, they fought all the time and they, they communicated constantly. So there was a, it's a very, very dramatic household to grow in. So that fire, that passion, that circus, that revolving door, you never knew who would show up. 
Right. It could even be a very prestigious client for uh, having their portrait done. Anything, you know. Right. There's a whole. Um, you could be as easily seeing a president as a high society woman as you know an interesting. But one thing, Ustra, my father always said to me, and he would always say these wonderfully profound things. He said, "Beta, it doesn't matter whether they're a king, or you know, have no money. Everybody must be treated exactly." The same way. So I grew up with the same ideology, as you know. And my father always said, "The person you know who greets you at the elevator versus the one in the presidential C suite." Yeah, they exactly. All have equal right to being treated, and I feel that that part of you is one of the things I most really, really love and respect. No, I'm just scared of people in period. <laughs> I don't care who they are. <laughs> So I'm gonna shock, pick, shock, horror, horror. I'm going to pick up on the word scared because to me you're one of the most courageous, bravest, authentic people I know, and you often use that in a teasing way that you're scared. <laughs> What does it mean to you when you say a statement like that? You know, when you're scared of everything. It makes life pretty easy. You know,、um, when you're just terrified,、um, because then nothing is scary. Because everything's scary, nothing's scary. Yes.、Scary. Yes. Does that make any sense? Of course it does, because we're all the whole and all nothing at the same time. Yes. So it's、uh, it, it just empowers that in its own through its own lens. Yeah.、Um, I mean, you meditate. Every day. I've been doing it since I've been thirteen. I started. Uh, my uh, aunt uh, lived in Chicago, and I remember being on the floor. Uh, of a bedroom, I was sharing with somebody, and then I started meditating, and I've done it ever since then, every day. So, what does it? What led you to it? Was it some? I don't know what led me to it. I have absolutely zero. No, 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 no. I don't take. Well, I don't. Take, I'm pretty. The only people I really listened to were my parents. I mean, like, no, no, no. It just started. I don't know from where, from the ether. And many things in your life start from the ether. I guess they do. You could describe my life as one big glitch. <laughs> so when when you meditate, do you empty your mind? Do you see visions? You try to, Ezra. You try to, Ezra. The mind is a very powerful thing. And it always tries to intrude, but that's the peace and beauty of it—that you create a separate space, you know, an an in-between space for yourself for a little bit. And when you enter that space, what does that space mean to you? You don't know. You just need it. It's something you need, or at least I need. It's something you need, and it nourishes you, or it helps you make decisions, or no, it's not a one by one. No, it's not like there's nothing you can put into words. It's it's a it's a need for me. It's a desire. It's, a desire. it's like my work process. It's a desire. You know, you just need to do it. And one of the places that you love to meditate is your stunning rooftop. Yes, but I can do it in a car. I've done it on planes. I've done it in cafes in Paris. I mean, I've done it all over the place. I can just like blank up. So you find it easy to quickly go into meditation? No, I can't. I mean, I'm an old, old man, Uzra. I'm older than any person you can possibly ever meet. So yeah, by now I can just like click. And wherever you are, and how long do you normally meditate for? Oh, it depends,、uh, you know, ten minutes onwards. And、uh, for those of you watching who struggle with meditation, because I've struggled for years with meditation,、yeah. uh, Amin is one person who gave me great advice because I'm a runner, and when、mm. I run, I go into this like you know zone. You, you go into the state, and、right. you know, I'm just fully in my zone. And Amin had told me, forget all the. The you know putting the candle there and having rituals, you're experiencing that because I get a lot of epiphanies, a lot of、um, yes. uh, inner voice and God statements while I run, 
and you had always told me that that's my form of meditation. Yes, it is. And yes, I it found is, that right. very wise, and I found that very insightful on your end, because we can, like, you, you had such an easy journey to your meditation. It was like you were called to it. Whereas for me... I kind of I fell know. into it. Yes. <laughs> like I fall into anything in my life. Ozra, I really did not want to be an artist. That's why I did econ for four years. I mean, my plan was never to go back to Pakistan, not to be an artist, and, and live in America. That was the plan. And you're clearly living that plan. <laughs> yeah, that's why I stopped making plans, Ozra. <laughs> well, you know, it was hard because you look so great in this eye banking outfit. Don't, don't I? Like I said, I'm in drag for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, that I'm just amazed you even owned it. <laughs> Sweetie, I know, what kind I of South Asian man do you think I am? All over the world. <laughs> I've seen you dressed in so many like, stunning ways. Usually when you see me, Ozra, I'm in a dirty t-shirt and very smelly sweatpants. Yes, I've also seen you dressed to the nines for the awards. I've seen you be polished. That's for you, my uh, I know, lady. I know. You do a lot of dressing up for me. And it was so funny when you said, I will bring it on Monday, because you have. So I want to talk about your rooftop. Even yes. though you can meditate anywhere, you have one of the most beautiful rooftops in the world. And yes. for years, you've Thank told you. me that I have to do my rooftop up, and I will one day when the right moment comes. But talk about the journey to yours, because it's it's such a beautiful, peaceful, open space, and yet it's so you. And yeah, well, so wherever I've lived, I mean, when I've when me and John first moved back to Pakistan after Yale, John was with me at Yale. And then one day I said, let's go to Pakistan. And he thought we were coming for three months. This was in the 90s. And I wasn't thinking, as always. Um, and we used this as a home base. And my parents gave us the roof, our KDA roof. And I did a mosaic up there. And ever since then, I've always marked my places by a mosaic. And when, the, when we started living together in Clifton, uh, uh, there was a roof. And the whole idea was one day I would take over the roof. And so, you know, one day I, I took like a year out of my life and spent, devoted it to the roof and created the space, which is both public and private. And down below, uh, I have a gallery space. Again, this is John and my idea that uh, we'd open up the space, not just to my own work. It's called the Amin Golgi Gallery. So primarily I show my sculpture downstairs, but then once a year we open it up for experimental shows, which are usually accompanied by documents, by catalogs. And these, this is, since it's a non-commercial space, it's open to experimentation and um, fresh ideas. Well, I know that in addition to your own art, you have become such a critical force in building a community uh, and, and working with a community of artists. Obviously, many people build it together. But whether it was curating the Karachi Banale or these various shows you do, exhibitions, even during lockdown, even pre-lockdown, you have these amazing, amazing global and now globally virtual shows that you put together. Can you talk about that part? Sure. I mean, the quarantine has been an incredible time for me, a really productive time. It started with Lal Jadu, which me and Sarah Paganwala co-curated. And um, it was on March 15th, the Ides of March. Uh, it was a show of about 65 works of performance in this wonderful old space owned by the Paganwalas, a building on I.I. Chundriga Road, semi-abandoned and very David Lynch. And you had to sort of, the idea was you meandered through the rooms and the staircases and through the maze of space and experience uh, the show. Hello, can you hear me still? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, it was supposed to be very experiential, where you could see, smell, taste, touch, all these works. And um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to, it was the first time in my life where um, uh, I, I said, please don't come to the show. And um, we had it only viewed through live feed. And um, then the second show sort of grew out of that. And again, it was me, Sarah, and Adam Fahim Majid. We all three curated a show called The Trojan Donkey, which is only performance on the net. It was April 25th at the height of the lockdown. We asked 85 artists from across the world to create performance works that we put forth on April 25th. 
and you can still view it on our site. In fact, we're going to have a webinar shortly next Saturday, and I hope your viewers can join us there. It's a fantastic panelist of seven people, both from the North and the South. These, these people are just incredible with incredible points of view, and I think they should be heard. And then, of course, then me and Sarah did another show, and this time we wanted it real. Uh, we wanted it physical. Well, physical as we can be, given given the disease that surrounds us. So we did a show called If These Walls Could Talk. And it was in the Village Restaurant, which is an iconic restaurant uh, owned by the Big Muhammads, and right at the heart of the city in Karachi. And this restaurant was very important in the 70s. And we had videos, uh, 34 works, uh, projected onto the wall of the village restaurant in, uh, and they were all silent videos. And it was fantastic because these videos could be seen by the city at large. And, um, and people came in the car, so they were all socially distanced. And, um, uh, and you know, there was, you know, everybody stayed within the cars and they drove away. Osra, you're muted. Yeah, no, I, I want to hear your I voice. I don't want to hear me. No, I want to hear you. Oh, oh God! <laughs> no! Lockdown and this quarantine in such a powerful way to be more productive. Plus, these catalogs that you're trying to get me to do for Eden's it's important, Ustra. Look, you know why, Ustra? Uh, because they call, you know, when we were doing the, this book on the 1970s, you know, um, and me, Neela, co-curated the show. Neela Farouk co-curated the show in the 70s. And then we put out a book that John, uh, me, and Neela edited together on the 1970s, a cultural, informal cultural history. And when we were looking at records, there were so few records to be found. So that's one thing I want to leave behind. I want to leave these documents behind. And, and it's so wonderful in the art scene. It's not just me, but people are cataloging. You know, it's so important for future generations. If they do want to study what happened in Pakistan at this time, they have, they have uh, resource materials to access. And that's really important. We have to write our own history. Of course, the person who writes the history is defining the history. Exactly. I Don't you think it's about time we, the colonial servants, slaves, write? So, and push forth our point of view. So while you're intellectually completely correct on that point, the reality is it's a lot of hard work. It is. It's, it's a pain in the ass. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. So one bleep, thing bleep. I think that people should know about, one of the Amin secrets, is how neurotic, and I am <laughs> you are, you're, you're, you're how pushing me out of the closet, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There was a time in our life where we met every Friday, and it had to be at the exact time, yes. the exact amount of time, and, the and then we talked about everything, Ozra, if you remember. And you said the most wonderful thing to me. I said, Oh, Ozra, two of these most important men in my life are not there anymore, my anchors have gone. And you said, then I mean, you will sail. And that was so wonderful, Ezra. Those are wonderful times we had together. They are beautiful, beautiful moments from my heart. But I, I wanted to let everybody know that you are a secret closet neurotic. <laughs> and you I'm know, just like, like you. And not just because you're dressed <laughs> ranking today, but there is this genuine, not only incredible work ethic, but also polish and perfection and excellence. Excellence. But you know what I'm lucky with? with? The people I work with, like Sarah Paganwala, whoever comes across my life, also have that in them. You know, they're real believers. I, I tend to find believers. And these days, everybody I find is young. I hate young people, but for some reason, I tend to be working with them. Well, I think it, it adds so much to your work with the chemistry and the leverage of other brilliant minds. And of course, Sarah, Adam, and all are. We have um, amazing compliments coming through from Bismas talking about how gorgeous your rooftop is. Oh, Rehan, thank you, Bisma. Yep, Rohan talking about how brilliant your mind is. Oh, oh thank you. What about my body? We will definitely, definitely welcome that. We have um, 
<laughs> complimenting the not overuse of privilege. Uh, <laughs> someone else complimenting on your reading. Uh, Nadia is talking about how brilliant an artist you are. Oh, thank you. But you know, as well, my work really means everything to me, and everything is interconnected. Curating, performance, object making. Like I did these shows in Rome in 2018, and uh, one was at Gallery Art Moderna, and it was really lovely. I got the cloister uh, of this museum, and I could set up my calligraphic sculptures and create this sort of garden space within. And then the other space was Matetea, which was a contemporary museum, which is dark, it was an abattoir. And, you know, we, one recreated that installation to fit that. And it was such a wonderful, wonderful experience. And the act of making is also so liberating. And, you know, I was in Florence mm. uh, a few months after your big Rome show, and yeah. I still found ads across Italy. Like there oh, were really, Jano Man. Thank you, Paolo de Grande, who was my curator. <laughs> I love you, Paolo. <laughs> so you are known especially, although there's many, many things you do, you're known especially for your sculpting. Yes, and I like, I'm a physical person. I touch. I, I want know. to be touched. I know. I know. Very <laughs> badly. <laughs> but uh, you also, you also have done at least to my knowledge, six paintings, but there could be more hidden away shush, somewhere. Shush, shush, shush. <laughs> no, no, this is a no-hall's conversation. So talk Only about Samira knows. <laughs> Miss <painting>. Raja. <laughs> is, it, is it coming back? I, I was who knows what will come. See, that's with my life. Um, remember, I was supposed to live in America and never be an artist. After that, I've stopped making plans. It's like water in my life. It will flow where it goes. You know, and you just let it be. And you just, you know, you, there's a certain submission to it. <laughs> there is. I find that when I make plans, all I do is make God laugh. <laughs> so mm. it's literally. So, um, but your jewelry as well is something. Oh, I used to make a lot of jewelry. I stopped in 2007. I went cold turkey. And I love making jewelry. I love people wearing my work. It was a way of me touching them. I was around the necks. In the, on the ears. I didn't really do it for women. I did it for anybody. I mean, I actually made it for myself, anything I'd want to wear. And people wore it. And I never took commissions. I kept it very user-friendly for myself. And it was wonderful when it lasted, but then it vanished. So it just, it comes and goes organically. Um, you let it go where it goes. So Rima is praising your jewelry. Oh, uh, hey. Others are asking for jewelry classes from you. But you I don't give classes. Like I can't teach anything. I'm too stupid. I mean, you can only teach technique. You can't teach vision. Vision is something you have. Well, that's just so profound. I had to pause. Oh, God, second. please don't say that. <laughs> don't you make me. It's so really true. Some... It's so obvious <laughs> that uh, technique you can even learn from YouTube these days. But yeah, you the, can learn it from. The... I learned, you know where I learned my technique, Johnny? My parents were totally against me being an artist. So when I first came back, they were like, oh, shit. Like, you've gotten really good grades. Um, you know, <laughs> come on, do anything but. <laughs> um, and so, um, uh, you know, there was an area called Jamshed Road, which was in the KDA area, where there were dent cars. And from 12 to 4 o'clock, I could get the cheapest time that I could work with the dentists. And that's where I learned my craft, on the streets of Karachi, between 12 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning. So it's completely hands-on, literally. Literally hands-on. And also you were drawn to it, like the meditation. You just showed up doing it on the streets. Well, I started. I'd done some science fair projects using metal. And again, yes, it was another. It just was sort of given to me. You know, that is um, all these things in your life that are coming and going and everything's so fleeting. What does this whole COVID situation feel to you holistically? Because I remember when it started, you told me that even if the whole world is in chaos, I would, I would be soaring and I would be centered. And I found this is a very amazing period like you have, but it's been an overwhelming year. It has been an overwhelming year and it is a very difficult year, Ozra, because, uh, the 0.01% have gotten unimaginably rich. The billionaires have made so much money during this crisis. And for the poor, 
whose lives are already difficult, it's gotten so much worse. And already there was this huge divide. And this divide has just, COVID has exasperated the divide. And this seems to be so much greed in the world, you know? And sometimes I feel like, does everybody feel that they're immortal? Will they take it with them like the pharaohs, the pharaohs? Uh, I don't understand it. I really can't get my head around it. I really can't. And, you know, um, hopefully there'll be some light, inshallah. You know, it's, um, it's very humbling seeing what's going on. And, you know, we've been doing our food rations. And we've crossed 3,500 families. We're working towards 4,500. And when I was working on the fundraising, I sent a message. Uh, out to you know everyone and one person wrote that if this maid wanted a job she could got, get it she's just lazy so we wrote back and said if you wish to hire her please do so she'll work for you tomorrow and she was having difficulty because no one wanted someone who comes back and forth on a bus because of COVID sure. and the reality is people just don't know the truth of the pain some people are feeling the people who drowned in these floods and you talk about the widening gap between the have Yeah, look at the first world. Was rough. Forget Pakistan. Look at the lines for food banks in America. I mean, you know, look at the single women out there, you know, who are, who are trying to support single mothers. You know, and a lot of them work as waitresses uh, because they, they, it has flexible timing for them. I mean, it's, it's hard. It is hard, and you spoke a few minutes ago about some people, do they believe they're immortal? Can they take with them? And you had told me that you wanted to have a moment in this talk where you sort of speak about your parents. Yes. And what happened. Sure. As well as, and so please it's it's a fact. Right my parents were murdered in 2007, and my life collapsed, and all I saw was black. And then Benazir was killed 10 days later and my back collapsed and I was in unbelievable amounts of pain and I couldn't move. And I would lie on the carpet and even to walk a block would take me an hour and I would hobble and I would hobble and everything was just pain. And then, uh, shukar, alhamdulillah, um, you know, that's where religion fucking uh, kicks in. And um, I had two shows planned for myself and, um, and they were, and I had to work. I had to hobble to the workshop and I would hobble there, It'd take me an hour to hobble there and everything was paid. But because the work and I, I had to work, uh, it kept me sane and alive. It kept you sane and alive, but it wasn't a moment in time because even to this day, you still have this nonstop legal side to it. It's not yes, because after happen. my parents' thing, land grabbers came and took away all our properties. My father had invested all across Pakistan, and land grabbers came and you know took the uh, you know and there are all these cases. And then somebody claimed to be the only heir, not my uh, brother or stepbrother, but the only heir, and wiped me and my sister off of Nadra. We have a identity card in Pakistan. They wiped us off of it. And I mean, again, this has been addressed and I've had wonderful lawyers who I'm extremely grateful to. I, I mean, the only way I can do is go through the court system and uh, the, the lawyers I've been associating myself with have been wonderful. And anyway, this is, you know, it is what it is. And, um, but, you know, my life has gone on. I've been productive and I've done things and that's what's truly important. And that's something I owe my parents and myself to continue. And you do, and you don't just do things, you do extraordinary things. Tell me, really, John. <laughs> I, I, I must say my heart always goes out, because you know I loved your mom and dad. I know I that, sweetie. That I, know that. I know that. And, I know that. You know, I know that. I used to call Golgi Uncle my mirrors and oh, he gold uncle. Because he used to put oh, mirrors know. and gold in paintings. Yeah. And, um, you know, and your mom was just such an icon. But she was powerful, bro. I mean, that woman was incredible. Um, she was the first Muslim girl of Bombay. Back then, it was called Bombay, not Mumbai, to get a scholarship to study chemistry in Ohio. So she winds herself up in Ohio. And uh, she meets my father in London. They court, and then they elope in Paris. 
Yeah, it's very cheap. Remember, remember that, guys. This is, this is a hardcore romance. And what year did she study it's so in Ohio? Cheesy. It's such a cliche. It is a cliche, but it's your legacy. It's your legacy. I guess, yeah. What, 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 was, um, what year was it that she went to Ohio? Just to put this oh, in don't, perspective. I don't know. No, I don't was, know. I don't know. Like, I think they got that. married in, like, 62 or something like that. Like, yeah, but you know. it was a time where very few women, Muslim Oh, she only wore a sari. She did, the only thing she knew, she, I mean, she only took saris with her. <laughs> She'd worn nothing but a sari. But just like I've always have such strong memories of your mom wearing saris. Yes. And you you not looking like an eye banker. Like you're, like, <laughs> you're shattering. It was like you've always seen me out of the workshop, girl. Okay, so the next time, the next time I have a party and I say dress formal, you will bring this, not just Shirani or something. And so when you, um, why don't you talk a bit about some of the other challenges? You've talked about so many, and I don't want to regurgitate that, but what are the other unexpected, I don't know, twists and turns your life has taken? You've talked about quite a few, like even just the life you're living, but on your journey. Oh my gosh, it was, uh, I mean, you know, when I started, I mean, I remember with the imam, and he wasn't giving me a show because way back then, I mean, I'm a dinosaur, you're talking about the early 90s, nobody would show sculpture. And Imam Saab had the only gallery in Karachi, and he was he's sort of the first, our first major gallerist of Pakistan, Ali Imam. And I remember going to him and pleading with him, Imam Saab, please give me a show, please give me a show. For six months, I... I, I was like, <laughs> I was on him. <laughs> you know, I can be a little intense. Um, uh, and I begged, I pleaded, and I got myself my first show. And, you know, and even in the, my gallery space, it was to open it up for installation and performance and all of the stuff that, you know, we only, we don't have museums in Pakistan, unfortunately. Or we don't have so many museums, modern and, and contemporary work. So the whole idea was to open up spaces so all this fresh energy can come in and sort of like interact and you can have interaction and it could be the sort of cesspool of you know, spawning ideas and energies. And because there's a tremendous energy in the city I live in, the horrible, terrible, great city of Karachi. There's, there's, I mean, it's an ugly, godforsaken place, but there, it breathes, there's a drop to it. There's an energy, there's a pulse that goes boom, 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 boom. And, you know, and one thing to hand it to the artist community, they're always there to come forward. There's, there's such a great need to express yourself. And it's wonderful to tap into that energy. You know, this energy, this boom, boom, it's so palpable in Karachi. It's mm. a city of resilience. It's a city of... Alchemy. We have the cockroaches like of Pakistan. Oh. If you'll survive you know, nuclear oh. war. Cockroaches <laughs> have their own role as well. Don't knock them. They're not oh, no. <laughs> as long as someone else comes and shoes them out of my way because I'm screaming, then, you know, it's one of those things. But, you know, there's something deeper there. There's some purpose. I remember in this entire journey of our friendship, you have always consistently, maybe with your art history background, maybe with your father's legacy, you have always um, been as well as positioned yourself as a representation of the nation. Even that I don't know. No, 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 I no, mean, no, 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 I know, but what I mean is you're documenting your life, as you are for future generations, and the community of art, but also you've created spaces and represent the nation. Like Amin Gulji Gallery has now a series of exhibitions and catalogs that are part They're of... They're just experiments. It's an ex They're innocent crazy out there experiments where I get, you know, for some reason I can find other insane people around me. I've got this great gift for finding insanity and, and genius and, <laughs> and just to bring it together in this chemical, you know. I know, but 
there's still like this beautiful formality behind the scenes, like your hidden perfectionism, your hidden neurosis. <laughs> is, this is belonging to the legacy of Golgi now, me and Golgi. And when you had your sculpture at United Nations, it was a moment of so much pride for us, so much well, pride I was for so us. grateful. I was so grateful to Malia Lodi mm -hmm. who really pushed this piece and made sure it was installed well. And she really worked hard over that. And I'm extremely grateful to her for that. And I'm, I was really happy to see my piece out there. Really, as an artist, you know, I was so grateful. Because, again, anything that comes from me is done for me, Uzra. I don't do anything for anybody else. Uh, uh, it has to be my own shit for my shit. You know, it's my shit. While you say that, your piece does represent our nation while representing you and while you say that so many times you've held my hand or guided me or in a way encourage encourage is probably more accurate uh, my craziness and my craziness. Oh, you know, you are a force of nature girl <laughs> i know you you really you are and that's a, force that's of a nature. Brilliant because the, the the future of our nation does not rest in the hands of men it rests in women I mean, they're the ones who will change things. And even in my generation, it's always been the women who've broken the mold. The men just fall into their roles and are the good little boys. But it's the women who, who are the courageous ones. No, for sure. And it is men and women side by side, like we're side by well, side right now. Yeah. That really, really are necessary. I don't ever believe it's one or the other. Well, I think it's the women. I think there's nothing more powerful than a Pakistani woman because I've had to deal with so much. And the ones that emerge are truly powerful. I agree that Pakistani women are powerful, but I'll say that I'm very proud of our men, including you as well. What does success really? mean to you? I know you talk about things. There is no God, success. There's nothing like success, Johnny. There's only to be happy and to be centered, you know? Uh, and to be free as an artist. And I feel really, 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 truly, truly grateful to the powers that be that, you know, whatever I've done, it's for me, whether I'm making a small pair of earrings or a 24 by sculpture, it's something for me that I completely own. You know, I hate the word saying, you know, but anyway. Uh, Making sculpture is so isolated. That's why I like co curating with people because you're with somebody like Sarah, or who, you know, and then, and then there's a dialogue in co curating and working with artists that you break out of your isolation and, and you sort of like experience other points of view. Because for my object making, that's me, my, I'm very territorial. And you're also in a total zone. Yes. Uh, and you're very disciplined about it. Talk about your, your discipline. <laughs> you wake yes. up every day at the same time. You start the same way. You're very particular no, no. with the people who work with you. Talk about that. I'm not going to Okay, I'm a fascist. I'm horrible to work with. You know, you can call up any ex curators. They'll cry to you. <laughs> no, um, uh, uh, I'm, yes, um, I'm, I'm really structured. I make structure. That's why I love books. They have structure. Uh, and structure is really important to me. Breaking once you know structure, you can break it. Well, of course, that once you know the rules, you can break them. We all yeah. know that. Uh, but there's more to the sculpture than structure. There's also the vision you spoke about. There's also a journey because your sculptures have evolved over the years. Can you yes. talk about like the first sculpture you actually made? I'm not talking about on the streets of like talk Johnny, about. I can't, but you know. It's a story, they're threads, and you pick up the threads and you push them along, and it's always a surprise. That's why one does this stupid stuff, that it's a surprise. I'm led by my work. I don't need my work. You know, it takes me wherever it does. And if the world loves it, I'm really grateful. If the world doesn't, I will understand, and you still keep on doing what, you're, what you do. Okay, so I, I get how... It's their whole it's way of doing things. You know, walnut, <laughs> small brain, hard encased, <laughs> encased in a hard shell. <laughs> I get how it's your journey, 
but that means that when you do a piece of sculpture, you don't have the vision in your head of what it's going to end up. Do. It's really fluid. I don't sketch or draw anything. So it's you with you 24 seven. No, I don't sketch anything. So it's with you. I mean, everything's like problem solving. And a lot of times pieces don't come through when you're in the process of making objects. And a lot of times they go into my storage room. My storage room is as large as mine. And I'm very easy. No, it's just not happening. And sometimes many years later, you dig it out of the storage room and it'll make sense. So each piece has its own timetable, its own trajectory, the way it forms. Sometimes you have a real vision in your head. Sometimes that vision changes. Sometimes you don't have a vision in your head. And you keep yourself legs wide open. So it's always different in its own way. Yes. And it's always just that element of surprise. And sometimes an accident is the best thing you've done all month. And sometimes nothing happens. And sometimes everything happens. So you used the word freedom earlier. Okay. Yeah. And then you use the word surprise now. Yes. And can you talk a bit about what freedom means to you? Because I love freedom, but you yes. also have great grounding in your life, both in your discipline, your structure, in your core relationships that have lasted for decades and lifetimes. I'm super old. And so, no, but I'm saying you have this incredible support system. I love Audra. I'm lucky. You know, I get loved and I'm so grateful. You know, people, I know I can feel the love, you know, and I'm loved. I, uh, in my awkward way, I'm loved. Uh, <laughs> You can always tell when someone loves you. And we do. You're, the love is very, very sincere. It's very real. But you also love back. It's a two-way street. You're a very good friend. Like you, you talk about things that I've said to you that have been very meaningful for you. And you always remind me. And you always remember them, which means a lot to me. But you said not. life-changing things to me. I remember one year you threw a birthday party for me. Do you remember that? Yes, a huge party at your yes. space with everybody in town. And you told me, and I'm, I'm sharing this with everyone because it reflects how beautiful your soul is. Amazing. You told me that with every single year, I will get more beautiful. And, you will. That's and not I'm, being nice. But that's just that's a bone structure. I know, but still hearing um, that on my birthday. I mean, also, is, also, you know, it's just the way you're being manufactured. But still, <laughs> I mean, the thoughtfulness, the caring. You didn't even do it. Your parents <laughs> or your people. The thoughtfulness, the caring with which you I mean, say that. Going to great law school, where did you go, Harvard or something? You know, that's you. That's, that's <laughs> because I'm your competitor that way, you. Mr. Yaley. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> you know, the rest, okay. <laughs> But I also want to say and share with others another beautiful statement you've said to me because it again reflects your beautiful soul. On my brother's wedding day, when you came to dance and don't you came get married. early and yeah. you refused to eat anything until you completed your dance, because I said, everybody eat first, we're going to serve food and then dance. You can dance, bro. <laughs> Johnny. Do you, you know, you said to me, you said to me, you arrived and you said to me, today I'm your slave. I'm anything your slave. Bro. And everything you want to make, I'm yours. <laughs> you don't know what those kind of phrases do to oh, my really heart. Oh, my really John. The, the friendship and the love is real because of. Uh, you know, it's organic, it's in both ways, but also you're an amazing friend. Your sincerity, you. your Thank caring, you. it's so, so, so real, so sincere, so, so you. And I think people like, they don't know your neurosis, which I love about you, <laughs> but they also don't know just what a beautiful soul you are. And what do you make of this time in our life where everything is sort of on hold or not on hold, but nothing you know, is on hold, right? It's evolving in a different way. We have just changed. Did you just the world has changed? Punches, or what? What do you think is going to be at the end of this? Because we're we're all isolated, yet we're all isolated together. And then we have social media as yep. a gift, and you know we we have the ability to talk like this, even though by the right. way we live actually next door. Which really right. makes sense. We're talking yes. on virtual means. Yes. Um, what is it holistically do you feel? You've read your Camus, so now you are right. totally educated on this topic. 
What does this mean? Who knows? We will all find out, Israel. We'll all find out, but the world has changed. And um, what does that mean? What does that mean? We're going to find out. We're going to find out. I think there's a polarization that is happening now, which is sad to take a word from Mr. Trump. You know, sad. Uh, it's great polarization between the right and the left. And we will find out. So um, it's something that is exciting yet scary at the same time because the future is unknown in that way. Well, the future and, is always unknown, right? It just has all these dramas of the virus. And don't forget the AIDS virus, yes. that people were dying. I mean, I'm an AIDS child. I mean, in school, I graduated in the late 80s uh, uh, when AIDS was rampant and there was no medication for it. And people were dying all around me. And since it didn't affect the mainstream, nobody really cared. And with this virus, it affects everybody. So people are worried. It's and back then, it, uh, it was a death sentence. It was a what? Death sentence. Death there sentence, was no, of course. There was no medication. Medication wasn't really evolved, and it was a death sentence. No, it's uh, definitely not. The that really happy topics as well. So, what's your advice for budding artists? Believe. Be in a fraud. Be hard headed. Be a small baller. Just believe. Have faith. Go on in what you do. I mean, there's a lot of pressure from all sides, from the marketplace, from the north, from what curators expect from you when you, you know, you're a young artist. I can understand it. A lot of sort of works that are encouraged by the north but whatever the pressures are keep a soul intact believe and go forth and inshallah you will multiply at least through your work and what what do you do or feel or think or recommend in those moments when you feel you can't move ahead i'm sure you've had those blood oh, yeah. i read i go into another narrative I'm easy. I'm an escapist. I just read. I just pick up a book and I'll fall right into it. And you know, I mean, very often you quote passages or a phrase from different books and you put them yes. in your social media. And very often they're quite romantic phrases. You try to oh, say. <laughs> love me, love me, say that you love me. <laughs> I remember oh, a time oh. where you went through a phase of making a, a series of sculptures, a collection, a capsule, mm. where you listened to Culture Club. The entire oh, that's time. right. Do you that? yes. yeah. So uh, do you always have like a different music or background or theme? No, I just have noise. I mean, uh, making sculpture is not, uh, especially metal work, bronze and copper. It is a, it's a coffin. And what I do is I just have you know, the radio station usually is FM 89 blasting with everything else. And I've got four guys and we, they, they know me so well. Everybody's been with me for years. So just hand signals and language. We don't really talk. Uh, talking is not encouraged. I'm a fascist. Um, and everybody's connected. We all have to be connected. So Maliha Bimji is now writing that it's about time we see more of your sculptures across our country, not just in the world, but in <laughs> spaces, as, uh, as that it will be good for the nation. She's oh, just talking really about our nation's you. needs thank and, of you, course, thank all you, thank over you. the world. Um, what is a question that you wish people asked about you? <laughs> it now comes out. <laughs> Don't ask this touch. No, no, you said no holes. The floor is yours for this one. Yeah, you know, you don't need questions. You don't need words. You just need a look in the eyes. You can feel people, Ozra, if you just allow yourself. You know, uh, people can feel you. Again, this Osberger thing, it's something I've had to overcome, and that's how I get around it. You just feel an energy from the people. It's not what they're saying, or I hardly remember who does what, unless they're intellectuals, and I remember. But otherwise, they're Karachi, this person. You know, um, 
and you just communicate with that energy. You just tap into that. Like, I mean, anybody I've met, it's always accidental, like, you know, and then they continue in your life. You know, that's a very uh, beautiful, insightful way of looking at it because I believe there's it? colors around people, they have auras. Uh, well, <laughs> I do. I do believe in the auras around people. Yes, I'm a little unicorn. What's my color? Your, your color changes according to your mood, my friend. But it's always one that I I'm love being around. Girl. Yeah, you, you, have, you have many places and colors. I, aren't you a rainbow, my friend? But I believe that the aura is palpable. It's totally, totally palpable. But on that note, we have finished our show. Oh. So is there anything you want to say to all these fans who are sitting here saying... Oh, thank you so much for listening in. Thank you all because, you know, for enduring me. And thank you so much for, uh, I mean, talking to you. This is kind of strange for me because these are the kind of conversations we have once in a while, these long-term conversations. And it's public, but it you know, it felt no, really private. Sir, but it felt private, private to me. Felt private to me. So, thank you, Ezra. Thank you. I'm greatly honored to have you on uh, two talks. I'm so proud of you, Ezra. Rock on, Ezra. Rock on. I'm proud of you too, and may you have the most amazing event in the next few days. I can't wait for your latest catalog. Hey, yes, I want to plug, plug, plug. Please join in for the webinar. It will be interesting. We have these incredibly out of the box intellectuals. Really, trust me. If you think I'm strange, we can hear them. You know, like join me, Sarah, and Adam for a webinar, and please join us. So we will definitely, everyone watching, watch Amin, Sarah, and Adam's webinar. And thank you so much for being here today. First, we're going to say bye-bye to Amin. And Love then is, to Love Love is. Thank you. Bye. Yay. Hi, everyone. This is... <laughs> That's just a little game that Facebook plays to say there's a teaser of a mean back and forth. But I just want to thank you all for tuning in today. It was an amazing journey. First, we interviewed Shalom of Fusion, our very own rock star, and then Florence. Our hostess with the most is the founder of Cafe Flow, and now we have a mean and all three are people I really love and care about and who are the pride of Pakistan but also really beautiful souls. And as we went through the journey today, I'm sure you could see that there was so much to the man and me, not just the sculpture, but the man. And you could feel his aura like I always do. And it's a beautiful aura we're blessed to have on this earth. So thank you for joining and have a brilliant rest of your day. Bye.